Um, oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't normally give us a sort of computer voice saying it's being recorded. As you've just been informed, we are recording the 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 audio and um, um, and our speakers video, but not you. So don't worry about that. Um, and it will obviously go up online shortly afterwards. Um, obviously, it's great you've all here. Um, um, I really encourage that you support the Society for Church Archaeology by joining us. If you're not a member, it's only through our members that we can continue to do these things. Um, and, you know, there's a whole range of talks, other activities and things that you can get involved with. But that's the sort of the hard, not very hard sell um, um, at that point. So I think I think we can crack on now. So I would like to introduce our speaker. Uh, tonight we have a real treat, uh, which is Professor Howard Williams uh, from the Department of History and Archaeology at the University of Chester. You might probably detect that Howard and I have known each other for more years than we probably would care to remember. Um, but he is, it's safe to say, one of the leading lights of his generation in his field. Uh, no, no, I think that's probably safe to say, and he's, he is a very well-known archaeologist here in the UK. Uh, for those of you who are more interested in other sort of technological platforms, he's also a notorious TikToker. Notorious? <laughs> It's, <laughs> I warn you uh, of that in advance, if, if you're aware of what TikTok is, um, I wasn't. Um, anyway, without any further ado, I will introduce his talk. Um, he's going to give us a, a talk on Viking Age hogback stones, and I'm really intrigued to see what he's got to say. So I'll hand over to Howard. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Hugh, and I'm really excited to be able to talk to you all about this topic. Uh, it's a uh, I just worked out that this is possibly my 11th talk of 2021 and it's been a, a on top of a teaching and research year from hell and now a redundancy process to add to the joys. Um, so I, I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel for topics I haven't actually presented on this year, but I, of course, I, what I'm trying to say is I've left the best to last of this, uh, this series of talks I've been doing. And I, it's lovely to be able to talk to you, um, you as a society. I, 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 I remember uh, quite a few years back now uh, taking you on a tour around Valley Crucis Abbey. And uh, it was away after a, a lovely conference in Chester. And so it's really good to uh, digitally connect with you all. And I see some very familiar uh, and friendly faces and names um, in, in the um, um, in the uh, lo long, long list of, of the audience and unfortunately some of my students who I bullied into coming along. Um, but nice to see you all and uh, to, uh, I look forward to your comments. Um, what I'm going to do in this is not a single talk, I'm trying to do about eight talks in one. In other words, it'll be a rambling, um, a rambling confusion of half-baked ideas, but then that's my career really. Um, what I'm going to be doing is uh, trying to talk to you about um, these wonderful hogback stones and hopefully he will tell me if this screen isn't working. It says it's sharing, so you can see um, just a, a, a nice um, lounge of different stones there that I'm going to be covering. I'm going to try and address um, some various different um, aspects of these intriguing, ever popular Viking Age stone carved monuments. I'm going to introduce hogbacks, or try to, because there's been a lot of scholarship on them, including by people in this audience, and I won't try and cover it all, but I'll just give a quick introduction. I'll then try and talk about how, um, some of my published ideas, uh, some of which appeared in this book from 2015. It's on reduced price with Boydell if you want to get a copy. Um, solid spaces of hogbacks. Um, then I'm going to look at um, uh, some ideas about how hogbacks might work in their broader material world um, as kind of citations in stone, citations to other things, other materials, as part of a broader, um, a broader sort of network of, of, of objects in this late Viking world. And then going to quickly uh, think about hogback heritage by having a look at one particular hogback at West Kirby, West Kirby 4, and they're going to go up the coast um, of the Irish Sea to Hesham and talk about Hesham's exceptional hogback. And they're going to go on and talk a little bit about some half developed ideas, uh, which I shall intriguingly label forebears. And then I'm going to deal with a bit of bear necessities. And then I'm going to try and bring up with my uh, wrap up with my Howard's final hog thoughts. And that's a bit, that's a structure for you. So you know where we are. You can no longer see a slide carousel slowly ticking away in these public talks and go, God, how many slides are left? Um, so you this is to give you a structure so you know when to fall asleep and when to wake up again. Right. 
<laughs> Without further ado, let me try and introduce these intriguing monuments called hogbacks or hogback stones. And the first thing to say is that they're very little um, to do with hogs. Um, the hogback simply is an antiquarian term to describe the fact it's got a bowed back. It's got a bowed top, like the back of a pig. Um, and that is as, as misleading as everything else about them, really. Um, this is a distribution map of them, culled from Lang's, uh, Jim Lang's work. Um, and um, the, the first point, as we'll keep reiterating, is that what is a hogback and what isn't a hogback seems to um, be a huge matter of contention. But I think regardless of various outliers and various debates about terminology and classification, I think we can all agree that whatever they are, and whatever we call them, these um, recumbent carved stone monuments that may be described as grave covers or tombs, uh, um, tomb shrines or various other terms used, these sort of these low carved stone monuments have a focused distribution on um, southern Scotland, southern central Scotland, and um, this this area from Cumbria, the Eden Valley, Valley, North Yorkshire, and then various intriguing clusters, such as in he around Hesham, um, around Morecambe Bay, uh, around the Wirral and the Trent Valley. Um, and so while there is discussion about exactly which of these can be defined in what way, there is here, I think, a broad sort of a, a broad sense of that we're dealing with a distinctive sort of cluster of monuments. Um, this is the standard classification for the corpus of Anglo-Saxon stone sculpture um, that has been widely used and it's developed from Jim Lang's work and this is my crude redraw of, of that um, to show that they are in themselves quite an eclectic form of monument. Um, they have that bowed roof, um, some of them are straight sides but many of them have bowed sides and a range of abstract decoration um, um, and, and a range of um, zoomorphic decoration and sometimes human figures mixed up with the representations of animals on their sides and of course these distinctive end beasts which take on multiple different forms sometimes they're absent sometimes they're diminutive sometimes they're um, distinctive to a particular animal sometimes they're dragon-esque or serpentine and sometimes they are quite distinctively and clearly ursine they're bears um, so they're they're, they're, they're bears on hogbacks. Already the terminology is confusing you all. This is perhaps the picture that appears in every book with Vikings in its title, um, the Viking world, the Viking whatever. Um, will, there will be a picture of at least one hogback and the most likely, if it's one or a cluster of them, it'll be the Brompton hogbacks. And uh, actually the last time I gave this talk was in 2016 in Brompton um, at the nearby village hall uh, within, within, um, within, I don't know, a waving distance at hogbacks, shall we say? Um, and uh, these are these are the, these are the hogbacks at Brompton in North Yorkshire near North Allerton. And so, um, uh, but we've already introduced you to they're quite a varied and eclectic c cluster of stone sculpture, very different types. And of course, another iconic site where you may have encountered them is at Govan, um, on um, where the the old church there has a wonderful collection of these these some of the largest of the of the largest hogback stones so while my bias is towards the english uh, and welsh border monuments in today's talk um let's not forget that there are there are um scottish cousins of these monuments as well and they 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 have uh, distinctive features of end beasts but also these tegulated roofs not all of them have it but you can see here that there is an attempt to represent in stone the shingles of a of a roof uh, uh, in some form and here's another famous site. This is from the Corpus of Anglo-Saxon Stone Sculpture Photography, not my photographs, um, um, showing you the Gosforth Five monument to, to give you that sense of how they are quite a, an eclectic range of monuments. And today they're all found in churches. Now that's the key word for you lot, isn't it? Churches. They're all found in churches today because, because uh, often they were found and rediscovered in the 19th century during uh, redevelopment work. And they've been put on display as curios, as part of the history of the church. Um, um, but And they are arguably almost all likely to have originally been carved and produced for ecclesiastical centres, but it's it's incredibly unlikely they were constructed to be um, to be on display inside churches originally. We we don't know for sure, uh, but it's most likely they would have been in 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 burial grounds um, or outdoor locations in association with uh, chapels and churches in the early Middle Ages. And these are all dated broadly to the 10th or early 11th century, although there is much discussion, as always, with stone sculpture about their precise dating. So these are pre-Norman conquest, Viking age, 
um, shrine tombs or recumbent stones found at church sites, now often displayed in churches or in museums associated with churches, and are, are seen as rare survivals of that exciting period that many people are interested in, and the, the, the integration and interaction between the, the Scandinavian Norse-speaking peoples settling and trading and raiding around these isles, and um, indigenous insular um, societies, um, early medieval communities in, in, in what is now England, what is now Wales, Scotland, and so on, but particularly in that northern English, southern Scottish uh, zone. And um, the, the challenge of interpreting these monuments has always been there because they are floating. There's, there's not really many if in, in their core areas, none in their core areas, and only perhaps one if you count the Winchester one, um, found in an archaeological excavation, in a modern archaeological investigation. So here we have um, a, 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 a one a monument from Ingleby Arncliffe, and I put it in this image next to a, a, a small cross of con crudely contemporary date from Brompton, Brompton 1A, to make the point that the, the themes that they show um, of these recumbent monuments perhaps are not really comprehensible without understanding the other bits of carved stone monument, the bits of stone banging around the same churches and discovered at the same time and that may have been originally associated with them. We cannot know for sure, but there is a strong possibility that these were originally in the composite arrangements and that the, the hogback itself is just one component of a bigger monumental setting. So we have these evidence of ridges and roofs, of beasts and the spaces in between, but they also may have a, a key sites like uh, Lythe uh, on near Whitby and at uh, Brompton and uh, elsewhere. We, we seem to have this association with, of the hogbacks with crosses. And it may be that these are either alternate ways of memorializing the broadly contemporary community, or they are actually part of composite monuments. So there's a host of reasons why these are are difficult for us to get our heads around really um, and they're, they're, they're slippery they're not easy to pin down even though they are iconic for the Viking Age you know we don't re we assume they have a burial context they were covering graves but we can't be sure because they are they've been later reused and dislocated from their original burial context they may be parts of composites they're often fragmented and worn because they've been reused in church um, architecture they've been reused as building material often um we we struggle to interpret them because we're so used to seeing them in black and white in in drawings such as these um, um or or um, these are from collingwood um, um or more recent you know black and white photography with high contrast to pick out the details but of course that is a contrivance of our modes of representation. They would have presumably originally been polychrome as would most or if not all early medieval stone sculpture. And I've encountered, because I made the mistake of saying that on TV in a, in a, on the TV programme, and I got quite a few emails from particularly angry Pictish stone people who didn't like the idea that their stones were once painted, but I'm not getting into that here. Uh, but I think we can rest assured based on analogy with shrines and other car, um, car stone early medieval sculpture from across Europe that these would have originally been painted in a range of contrasting colours and we've lost that so we not only got worn and fragmented monuments we've also got ones that are a bit bland compared with how they may have originally looked and remember with any carved stone monument you didn't have to carve all the features you were going to paint so they may have been detailed that we've now lost that was once painted on maybe crosses maybe other motifs um that, that you know haven't survived because they never were picked out and carved out they were just painted on so we often don't understand the ornamentation the, the different plat works and interlace <laughs> we often don't understand the fretwork and designs we we also don't always have a good understanding of the figural representations on some of the stones and I put these examples and there have been very strong uh, arguments been made from analogies with later uh, written sources uh, and from uh, Gotlandic picture stones and elsewhere suggesting interpretations for these in relation to Norse mythological themes and uh, um, I while we must be cynical of, or at least cautious with some of those, some of those are 
quite compelling. And when you see sort of similar motifs over thousands or hundreds, thousands of miles and hundreds of years difference, but they are very similarly composed, one, one has to be tempted to think that maybe there are stories here, stories in stone that are perhaps lost to us, but that one image, that one juxtaposition of reasonably abstracted uh, figures could have been easily accessible and understood to contemporary audiences. And, and, and traveling, these are communities with far distant trade networks, and they would have had those connections and those stories. So I, I, I'm not discounting any of that, but it's of course very difficult to work out. And we either reduce our interpretations to trying to find a biblical or hagiographical an explanation for everything. Let's remember that the stone Cern Abbas giant may die, date to the Viking age now, so we've got to find a reason to explain that. Um, everything has to be, you know, fact, we have to find a Christian analogue, or we go for a Norse analogue. And, and the problem is that many of these images are very difficult to, under, you know, fully work out. And if they are Norse mythological in, in, in origin, then they've certainly been adapted to the medium in which they appear. So it, it, it's a challenge to understand that figural representation. And if they are, as they seem to be, representing other materials, you know, for every one carved stone hogback, perhaps people would have encountered dozens, hundreds of wooden shrines and uh, uh, grave covers, then of course, we, we lack all that lost material, as is so true of all archaeology. We don't have often preserved from this period, apart from some urban sites like Dublin and Jorvik, you know, we don't have that rich preserved organic material. So we're actually, um, you know, Understanding the skeuomorphism, the fact that they've tried to render in stone something that perhaps contemporary people would have been more familiar with in other materials, you know, it's very difficult to understand the significance of that when we only have the stone. Um, and they are incredibly varied, and that's a real blessing and a, and a curse. And we either um, split it or lump us in archaeology, aren't we? And we either want to try and understand each on their own, on their own merits, or we want to have a big catch-all interpretation of all of these monuments and I think the challenge is how do we work with that variability of these stones how do we talk about them as in a nuanced way um, but not reduce them to individual monuments because we're you know we're all individuals I'm not so that was my introduction to hogback stones and I hope that's given you a flavor or a reminder for those of you who are expert on this topic as I see amongst you you know it gives you a sense of that some of the key things that I think are important about them of course there's there's a whole um, there's a whole literature review on them that I can't go through of people who have written articles and contributions to these monuments and based on that reading I've made some arguments in print that I think about some of the shared significances of, of these monuments so why I think we can and should think of them as a category, because while they're incredibly different, I think there are some versatile plays on themes that they are sharing. And so I've, I've gone into print and suggested that basically following the work of Lang and Bailey and others, um, that yes, I think we should try to understand these in terms of skeuomorphisms from a range of other materials in the insular world and within the broader Viking world, linking Christian um, reliquies and tombs and shrines through to secular objects and that broader world of halls and churches and to perhaps even pagan temples that were still banging around, not necessarily in northern Britain, but I mean in the broader Viking world, that this would have been seen as an architectural illusion uh, in stone. And I think it would have been read in that way at the time in broad terms, but adapted in various different ways. And we knew that we know there's a, a, a rich insular tradition of this going back from late, from late antiquity forward of both graves and shrines that would have been house like. And I think hogbacks are house like architectural structures. And um, in different ways, my point was in my 2015 article that we should think about that solidity, that weight and that corporeality, given the fact these may very well have been over graves, over bodies, over dead bodies, um, as absolutely key to their understanding. Because what you're looking at is a by rendering something in stone, this is pretty obvious thing to say, really, but I think the implications of it haven't weren't fully thought through I don't think in the existing literature by rendering something in stone that people would normally encounter as a hollow object or implies access to an internal space and uh, on, on different scales on multi-scalar so from from miniature little boxes and reliquies for up to grand magnate halls and and the biggest churches of the time would have been um, presumably 
um, of, of this kind of alluded architectural form, um, we are looking at a, a sort of emphasis on solidity and weight. These are weighing down the graves. They're protecting the graves through the weight of the stone itself. And the architectural shape is almost um, emphasizing that, um, projecting that protection. Um, and I think the end beasts are going to come into that too. And when, as, as other scholars have identified, when the, the cases where we have niches on, in the sides, in the long sides, implying access, and the argument has been that these may be attempts to sort of allude to um, St. Shrines, where you can, perhaps put, as, as in the bead quote I put earlier, that with St. Chad's uh, tumba, that you could put your hand in to access the relics as a pilgrim. Um, maybe we're looking at some play on that. But, you know, here, of course, it's, a, it's an inaccessible space. So you're playing with um, a solid space, an implied space that is made solid and uh, inaccessible. And I think that's a very powerful way of, or useful way of thinking about how these tombs would have worked. You know, end beasts protecting an architectural form that's solid, inaccessible, at least physically, maybe spiritually. And this is, I think, part of how they were playing with the, the symbolism of these, these monuments. And that different mon that idea, that general concept, I think is very useful for them thinking through, say, how different stones may have alluded to architecture in contrasting ways. And some of the ornaments on the side, when it's not figural art, may actually refer and allude to um, embroidery, to hangings, um, to the implying access into a space that obviously in stone, even if painted, would clearly be inaccessible. And when stories are carved on the stones, and I just put up this one example because for Beedale's fragment of a hogback, <laughs> we may be looking at scenes from the story of Wayland or Volander, the, the smith, the sort of anti-hero and gets who gets his revenge on the, the bad king um, through all what manner of ways I won't go into here. The, 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 the stories here are about sort of uh, imprisonment and then freedom and breaking out and maybe some of the, the carvings on these um, architectural alluding stones are trying to play with the idea of of the hall as a focus of power of the uh, um, but also the some of the moralities surrounding um those spaces um spaces of immorality and bad kingship and or lordship and good kingship and good lordship sort of eluded in these carvings so wayland maybe not so much about wayland but about reflecting on these broader codes and mores of how to be a good king, how to be a bad king, you know, what, what goes wrong when you are a bad king. And so I wonder whether, you know, though this is only a fragment and we can't be sure that this is a, a, a figure seated on a throne, as has been suggested with two figures either side, and you can, uh, um, and this is perhaps a bit of Wayland in his flying machine, uh, perhaps these, these carvings are trying to, in different versatile ways, play with this idea of a solid space. This takes us to the idea of, well, by definition, these are skewermorphs. They're playing on the idea of architecture of different scales. And my second point is that hogbacks, I think, would have been read by an informed aristocratic, clerical and perhaps even monastic audiences, as well as a broader secular elite, as um, plays on a whole range of other objects. And I think a lot of the time this has been seen in terms of, well, where did they get the idea? Which is, what is the influence? And Jim Lang's discussion I, I take is very much a, where did this idea come from? Was it from insulin reliquies? Was it from, you know, uh, halls? Um, where, where did this idea come from? And I think that's all very valid, but I would make the point, and I have made the point in print, that I think it's not one or the other. That I think um, if we could, we can sort of flip it around and say, well, it's not necessarily about who got the idea and who decided to carve these monuments in this form. Uh, it's more the question of what does this form do to, for audiences who are familiar with sacred, secular, architectonic uh, material cultures, small boxes that look like houses, houses that allude to those smaller objects and, and chests and treasuries and um, reliquies and so on. And I just put up the monument's reliquy to make a point that um, compare it with this Brompton hogback and the, 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 the beasts are basically like hinges. They are locking down access to the monument. Uh, they are both guardians and protectors, but also enforcers, watchers. And one could make the argument that if you are 
and this is almost they are uh, um, hogbacks perhaps had a power a commemorative power because they were um, comprehensible to very different audiences from across these islands and beyond that who would have recognized the, the symbolism to some degree of, of, of beasts guarding a, 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 a structure and that this was readily transferable across different media, different metals, different, uh, different stone forms. And so I just make the humble point that while they look superficially very different, many different material cultures in that late Viking world um, and if I forgive the crude, uh, the massive jumps of geographical and uh, representational media that I've used just to create this crude schematic, but it's just to make the point that hogbacks would have sat when they were carved and placed near or in near, near churches, I think, in, in burial grounds, they would have played off a whole range of other objects familiar to um, elite lifestyles and elite material cultures and that's how they would have drawn their power not that they were just simply inspired by um one particular form of material culture but everything from boat houses to saddle bows combs to tents these are this architectural form would have been versatile and i think people would have seen those forms in different ways in these in these hogback tombs so commemorating the dead if that's what they are indeed tomb covers commemorating the dead by making a solid space, but by drawing allusions, citations to a wide range of other objects. So I don't think we're ever going to pin down exactly where the one idea came from, but maybe that's not the point. Maybe the point is to flip the argument around and say that hogbacks would have been powerful and memorable as objects and, and in doing their job of protecting and commemorating bodies of dead people because they would have alluded to so many other types of our, our, our material culture. And so when you go and look at individual monuments and we imagine this vividly painted, perhaps associated with crosses in a, in a burial ground setting, um, you know, we would perhaps have, it, it, we, would, we can imagine a society anticipating this would be seen not simply as a solid space protecting the dead, but as a, an allusion to a range of other material cultures from, from um, you know, fr from, from halls down to these very small objects. So that's what I published, but then I want to share with you a few ideas that are, are ongoing and rattling on, really. Oh, no, no, I've, I've published about West Kirby, but I, this leads into areas that I haven't uh, published yet. And of course, then the task is to go from those grand generalizations. Yeah, Howard, that's that's wonderful. You've come up with a couple of general ideas you can waft around. But where does that where do we go with how varied they are? And I think, well, I think once we have that sort of sense that these are attempts to create solid spaces that commemorate the dead through their solidity and that allusion to spaces within solid space, with solid, solid material, and that people would have been in, in complex, widespread networks of the kinds that Soren Simbeck has um, eloquently talked about, drawing on archaeological and historical sources, you know, for the Viking world, this sort of small world of the Viking, the Viking world. This, um, where people would have had long distance direct connections, then people would have been aware of the power of this form. And it wouldn't have been just a, a Anglo-Saxon thing or a, um, a Strathclyde Britain thing or a, um, a Pictish thing or a Viking thing. It, it, it would have been a, a widely understood and replicable medium for commemorating the elite. And I think that then takes us down to individual examples. And I want to take you to West Kirby on the on the Wirral. And, um, and, and then we look at individual stone assemblages and we say, well, um, there's probably many more that haven't been found, but when the, the church was demolished in 1869 and, um, and the, uh, the re rebuilding, they found um, um, six uh, fragments of carved stone monuments at West Kirby on St Bridges Church right on the tip of the Wirral Peninsula and they're wonderfully displayed in a lovely little museum um, uh, and, and uh, obviously these are the, the imaginative elements the actual fragments of these uh, wheel-headed crosses um, are, are you know are, are inset into them we have some examples here we have this West Kirby 5, which is a fragment that may be from a hog bag, given that sort of um, diamonded uh, pattern that may be an allu crude allusion to a roof. But in the church, um, nearby, we have the Bidston hog bag, which is weird, but I just put it up so you know I know it's there. <laughs> Um, but we have in the church, this is West Kirby 4, um, it's a very strange hog bag because we, it's been bashed about quite a bit, shall we say. Uh, these are the photographs from the Corpus of Anglo-Saxon Stone Sculpture. And um, Bailey in 2010, when he published this, um, did a really good detailed account of this monument. Um, but from multiple visits with students and on my own and with some of you guys, uh, um, I, I, I came to the thought that maybe it hadn't been fully sort of 
explored. And, and so I, I did a paper in the Antiquities Journal that tried to sort of pick it apart a bit. And I suggested that part of the problem is this, um, the tradition of artistic representation that we have that focuses on the best side, side A. And this is Collingwood's, uh, sorry, side face C, sorry. Um, <laughs> this is Collingwood's uh, representation of it. This is it in the church. Oh, it was a few years ago anyway. Um, and that's the side that's presented out. Um, there's the Book of Remembrance, uh, the, you know, in a church setting, it's a busy setting. Um, something going on here with felt, you know, it's churches get used, but the side that faces visitors with the little display on the stool is that face C. But it's actually, uh, and this is the side that's used in the museum uh, glass doors. It's, sort of become, it's an icon of West Kirby in the Viking Age. And indeed in the Museum of Liverpool, which was opened about eight, nine years ago, um, they actually only did a mould or replica of one side, that, that iconic side, and put it on display with a, a with a Viking hall behind it to make the point that this is alluding to an architectural form. Uh, but it's it's not that simple because it's not conclusively a hogback at all. Um, there's no real direct parallels for the, the plat work and the tegulae, although the tegula do resemble other hogbacks. Um, there are parallels of a few motifs from around the Irish Sea, um, it's a weird, it's got a weird slope to it, which I can't go into here, but it's also very distinctive material and it's asymmetrical, by which I mean that um, there's, there's a hint there's something going on here, whether that's later bashing around or not. There may be a, a sort of residual end beast at the top. This is the laser scans done by um, Liverpool Museums, but it's really asymmetrical and sloping. And that's really quite clear that the whole monument is, is as, as we have it today, it is, is not really um, symmetrical end to end or from face to face. Um, and as you can see, there's a, there's a huge gap of material here that isn't carved, whereas on that face C, it is carved. And we've tended to focus on this side and this really much, poor, much more poorly executed backside to the monument has received no consi relative consideration. And so the monument is a bit of a mess. And I'd rather than see that in a derogatory way as clumsy and illogical, as Jim Lang said, um, I've suggested that this may be interesting. There may be something going on here that we, we need to think further about. Um, and this is just to compare the fact, I can't go into all of this, but just to make the point that there is there are contrasts in the rows, arrangement and depth of the ornamentation front and back or left and right, depending on the way you look at it. And there's this narrow, empty space at the bottom of one side. In my, my article, I argue that the wheel and bar motifs can be identified on the top and Bailey said you couldn't see that but you, I think you can so it's a crude attempt to mimic the front side on the back but it's much more poorly carved and I suggested that yes though those those bound forms um, can be broadly found in architectural form we can also find parallels around the Irish Sea so um, the monuments of West Kirby here uh, now that Nancy Edwards has published a North Whalian corpus of stones, we can find parallels at Disseth um, to the plat work and to this uh, chain motif. Um, you can see the, the, the chain motifs here on either side of a cross on a, on a cross base. And the material may actually come from North Wales, from somewhere between Rowan and, and Gronant um, in Flintshire, from, from uh, Denbyshire, historic Denbyshire up to Flintshire. And it's Kevin um, and the Court Sandstone. And so this monument suddenly seems to be telling us a very different non-Viking story and perhaps something much more distinct about the locality and the region and its connections. And I also make the argument that maybe it's a rush job and this may tell us something about the circumstances of its production. Um, maybe to do with the, the period, the duration of mourning when a, a carved monument had to be produced, perhaps by not no, no one who was skilled or had experience of using them. Uh, or maybe it was had multiple phases that only one side was carved and time ran out or circumstances intervened and a crude effort was made on the, the to do the other side. Now, we, we can't really decode the story, but my point would be that by thinking through that and thinking through its geographical context, as well as the, the, the idiosyncrasies of the monument, we can suddenly get a story that's about that particular monument. It's not just, it's a hogback, it's Viking, it's 10th century or thereabouts, but there's something maybe really interesting about how it's a bit of a rushed monument, you know, questions about whether it marked a single burial plot or a, 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 a multiple plots. Um, it's a very distinctive monument that perhaps uh, serves as a sort of protective membrane for dialogues with the dead. And that's, I think, really important. And maybe this focus on chains and bound 
sort of, you know, um, motifs is about sort of that sense of protection, but also sort of defining the occupancy of the grave. So my my point here is that we, we should perhaps less fixate on the labels. And we don't have to discount the labels. Labels are fine. You know, calling it a Viking hogback is cool by me. It gets people interested, people visiting the church. Everyone knows it as that. But then trying to make sure we can sort of talk to the, the specifics of a monument where there's some really interesting outstanding questions once we look at it in a little bit more detail. And so rather than clumsy and illogical, I think we can give it more credit by paying attention to both its, its, its distinctiveness and its perhaps less e e effective carving. It's not about dis denouncing it as being a bit rubbish, but thinking of it, in, uh, it in, on its own merits. And that really applies also to my discussion of the Hesham hogback. Moving up the uh, Lancashire coast um, to Hesham, the reason I want to talk about this monument is because, um, and I talk about it in terms of um, this, this area, is because this is another exceptional monument. It's probably the largest hogback from the English corpus, and it's it was found um, um, near St Peter's Church, but we also remember we're in a multi-church headland site overlooking Morecambe Bay with St Patrick's Chapel, which has received excavation, and it's an, a, a, a later Anglo-Saxon cemetery associated with this. So um, this was a holy site, perhaps a, a dispersed ecclesiastical landscape complex here. Um, really interesting location. Uh, and uh, as well as much else, we've got a hogback, and it's a very distinctive monument. Um, this is it with its uh, strange end beast that have been argued to be just a product of inept execution, but I think a really almost more sinister and scary by being strange little duck, duck, duck bill platypoid uh, hogbacks than the actual bigger bear like ones, I think, but then each to their own level of horror about monsters. But uh, I certainly would like these things creeping up at me at night, late at night. But anyway, these, 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 these sort of strange distinctive, whatever the intention of them to look like, whether they're supposed to be sort of micro dragons or whatever they are, framing this really huge bowed uh, structure with figural scenes on both sides that have been interpreted in, 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 in as, as relating to Norse mythology. So in terms of Bailey uh, and his publication, this is seen as unusual and prestigious, perhaps commemorating a trader dated to the early mid 10th century. And it's part of an Ill illustrative type because it's got that extended niche type end beasts and then these, these, these scenes that may have biblical allusions or Norse mythological allusions. <laughs> and if they're Norse, do they relate to the legend of Sigurd, the dragon slayer, or Ragnarok, you know, mythology? And uh, Thor Ewing and Lila Kopar, who I know is in the audience, hello Lila, um, have both favoured the Sigurd story. Um, um, and and I, I think that's a really, I think we've come a long way with, with our understanding of this monument. But my, my point is that I think it is, it is weird. It is odd. And if we think of this as um, a structure um, that, you know, sits alone in an ecclesiastical landscape, one wonders whether in this context it ever had any parallels anywhere. You know, um, um, was it trying to emulate a some form in metal, some other form of, of material that was known to this particular community? Because we certainly don't have anything quite like it um, in um in our corpus and i i wonder whether um, another point to make is whether it's actually representing myths or not um how are those myths being deployed in this particular funerary context uh, and particularly some of the beasts are very difficult to understand in terms of the the scenes that they're supposedly interpreting and i, I cannot help but notice that, that range of animals does bear resemblance to some of the viking age manx sculpture with them sort of menagerie um upon them and and rather and, and is there a sort of possibly even a mixing together of multiple stories in, 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 in motifs that could have been deliberately ambiguous and shared amongst communities. But be that as it may, um, we have these wonderfully, ridiculously short limbed, but rather scary, at least to me, um, end beasts. This is the big beast and the small beast. And the point is it is asymmetrical end to end again, that the, there is a big beast and there are a small beast. It's not, it's not a symmetrical monument. And we can put that down to ineptitude and we can say that there's, there's something going on here. So I haven't got answers for you, but I, I mean, is it again, is it useful to think of it as a hogback and Viking or does that just get in the way? Cause I mean, it's a very unique monument. Was it really a grave cover, cover or a grave marker or something else? 
and how did it operate in that particular ecclesiastical landscape? So I don't have answers for it, but I, 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 the reason I put these questions out there is because I, I was asked to give a talk about the Hesham Hogback at Hesham itself in the church as part of the 2017, I think it was, Hesham Viking Festival. And, I, and I, did, I did some tours with local people and we came back in 2018 and 19 and did activities with, uh, some of you may recognise Adam Parsons of Oxford Archaeology North there, um, and, 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 you know, and this is uh, Stuart Strong, who also is a, um, a, a living history educator. Um, we, we did some really interesting activities with local people, not by trying to tell them what their monument means, but by asking questions. And my point of my talk was to sort of say, this is a Viking hogback, but actually, what more can we say? How can we explore that monument and think about how special it is within its local context? but you're waiting for it. And I know I'm going to get there. We're going to go back to Brompton. Um, and this is stuff that, you know, taking on board this idea of solid spaces, the idea of citations, these monuments would have operated in a broader material world. Thinking about how with West Kirby and with Hesham, we're looking at very, very unique monuments that would have perhaps had very different roles in local settings. We then have to come back to Brompton, where one thing we know about Brompton is this church had a a pack, a horde, a flock of hogbacks. What do you call a collective for hogbacks? A, a shuffle of hogbacks. I don't know what the collective noun for hogbacks is. I should do a blog post about it if I probably already have and forgotten. But the main point is that there are loads of these beasts and they are all different. And I suppose my point here is while I've talked about citations to other materials, I think we have to come back to the stone itself and make the point that even though we don't know the broader material world in detail that these monuments operated in relation to, they were talking to each other. They were whispering to each other through one being carved after another. And we can see that as we look at these monuments. And this is nothing new. People have talked about this. Just go through. This is a small dinky hog back that if you want to find a prosaic interpretation you could say maybe it was over a grave of a child and I don't think that's an outrageous suggestion but my point is you know we don't know the motives for the scale and the distinctive arrangements of these monuments. Uh, here's Brompton 25 which is um, a really distinctive broad limbed four-limbed um, giant almost sized uh, bears and now, this is a complete fantasy and I haven't I'm not trying to say that this is the way it was, but we have to try and work out or think about these monuments as talking to each other as in relation to each other. And they couldn't have been all carved at once. And we don't know exactly which one was carved first. But my point would be that there does seem to be a genealogy at work. Uh, uh, they are playing off each other in the same way as that I've talked and other people have talked about burial mounds augmenting a a sort of 6th, 7th century Anglo-Saxon cemetery, each new mound responds to an old mound, and sometimes they're responding to far, far older mounds. And in the same way, we can think, I think that's a very useful way of thinking about monuments like this that would have presumably sat in close proximity in an ecclesiastical space and in a, in a burial ground and would have talked to each other. Um, I would have made references to each other, drawing on a, a tradition, but trying to do something different each time. And again, we can look to later effigy tombs in uh, churches as, as not exactly a, a direct parallel, but monuments that were deliberately constructed to respond to existing tombs. Now, I don't know which one is the first. I mean, I've, I've arbitrarily suggested here it's 24 my, at the top. I'm going top to bottom in time. Let's say 20, 24 is was the first one. And I think it's, it's parallels um, with um you know Bora art style and, and 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 other features have led scholars to suggest it could be the first but I, i'm not gonna and that's not a hill i'll die on that's not a hog back I'll, I'll die on um and then we have you know potentially various different avenues by which carvers same carver or different carvers may have added you know cited that monument or those collective monuments almost allusions to forebear monuments that's my forebears now, 26 is an aberration, doesn't seem to work with any of them. And some of them have the, have the sort of um, abstract interlace and, and, and um, plat work sort of side features. Others go down the niche route and, and the niche could go wider later on. Or could it have been the other way around? Did it start as a wide niche and go smaller? I, I think this is the most likely 
sequence, but I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm not going to stand by it. I've merely put this up as illustration of the fact that I think in the Viking Age, these monuments would have talked to each other, would have built on each other, that the commissioners and the, the commemorators were building a, a commemorative tradition. And they didn't probably have a destination. They didn't know how it was going to go, as so often with cemeteries today. Um, they, they may not have known how this would work. Um, and we don't know where they exactly were located, but I think there's an interesting th thought to be had there about how at these sites where we have multiple hogbacks, we don't simply have one-off exceptional monuments. We have a, a genealogy of citation where each hogback is referencing the one before. And it's not just uh, Brompton, but Brompton's one of the best ones for showing you that. And I think therefore, my point is, rather than the trying to decode the meaning of individual monuments, which perhaps is impossible for us, given we don't even have a context for them. Um, you know, they weren't, we don't have the graves over which these were located. We can still, I think, talk with some confidence about how they would have responded to each other, built up a story for themselves that doesn't need that broader network of citations or is, 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 is becomes more important than the original inspirations. And I think that's an important thing to think through about these these carved stone monuments. They told their own story by talking to each other as part of a genealogy of citation. And here's my perhaps most blatantly obvious point um, um, that I don't think anyone's actually raised, or at least I haven't seen it raised. So um, I'm happy to be corrected. Maybe David Stocker has. I'm sure David David has. I'm sure I'm sure he has. So I'm, I'm happy to be corrected if I if I'm saying something already in print. But my point is here that actually of all the symbolism and the potential illusions at the end of the day these aren't simply symbolic bears i wonder whether they are abstracted but perhaps the idea is with these bear end beasts they are actually trying to represent real bears now scholars have noted before that the bears are muzzled um and both the ones in the um, durham cathedral but i haven't been allowed to even go near them before swap teams descend and tell me to not touch uh, but also the ones in Brompton Church themselves. I think there is, it's difficult to prove it's original, but I think they are all bound on their, their right um, forearms. And certainly the, the, there are bands on the arms of the Hogback, um, uh, the, the, the Brompton 24 monuments, but also I think some of the others um, have very subtle hints of um, tethers. And my point here would be that, yeah, this is a symbol. This is maybe something about protection and, and guarding the soul and the body of the dead. And it's all to do with these ideas of material networks and blah de blah But at the end of the day, what you're showing, what you're carving on a stone and sticking a pair of, one on each side, are the biggest, scariest beasts, tamed, bound and watchful. Uh, it's difficult to prove this isn't later hacked on, but there's another example there and another series of pittings around the arm here and presumably again remember these would have been originally painted and so these subtle details may have been either painted over and they weren't important or perhaps they were picked out to show that they're representing a tethered animal almost like a, a kind of animal you'd want to have in your hall guarding your treasure or you occasionally fed annoying people too wish i had that in uh faculty meetings and so while scholars have gone down various christian symbolism roots including um, the idea of regeneration and um, the protective church being symbolized by a, a bear, protective bear or down the pagan route um, as with neil price here um, the images from his um, um, book um, talking about sort of potentially shamanic allusions to the bear and of course the norse um, and sami traditions of bear uh, from um, of, of bear and human bear transformation you know have been exhaustively uh, almost over exhaustively discussed you know i don't think we need to go down we don't need to go down these more esoteric routes to say that perhaps what we're looking at here is simply what it is it's a bear or pair of bears that are protecting they are framing and protecting the body and soul they're watchful watchful and bound guardians and that maybe while we can't prove that in northern britain bears were still in the landscape and i think most scholars would suggest they probably weren't and after the roman period we not we don't have conclusive evidence i don't think uh, of 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 bears in the wild i suspect bears were still an integral part of aristocratic lordly life and they were the thing you'd want and you don't need to be a norse speaker to how all you have to do is have access to those trade routes 
and you could have Northern European um, and Scandinavian bears as part of your court setting. And I think that's what they're putting at the ends of their tombs. Now, that's a whistle-stop tour through half-baked ideas, as I promised you. So don't say you didn't get what I promised. But I do want to finish with some hog, final hog thoughts, because uh, we've talked mainly about the Northern English uh, monuments and on the Welsh border, but that doesn't normally get into Wales. But I do want to finish with the wonderful Govan stones and say that church archaeology and these early medieval stone monuments have a bit of an ongoing weird tradition. They, are, they almost have a personality, these stones. They have a... They are, and, and particularly Govan has embraced that personality. They're almost like pets. <laughs> the church, the church pets, you know, they have a, there's, there's an affinity to them. They're the famous hogbacks, as this tweet from last month says on the Govan Stone's Twitter page. Three of our famous hogbacks. Note how these House of the Dead depict roof shingles, exclamation mark. Totally agree. Um, and they have a wonderful website. They've been, you know, they've had funding to to renovate and redisplay these. I, I was up there at the EAA conference in 2015 where we saw the wonderfully new lit stones, not just hogbacks, but other cast stone monuments in this church. And these these monuments therefore integral to the identity of the church. And whatever we think, whatever we say about these stones, whether we simplify them and say Viking hogbacks, or whether we try to talk about these more potentially more nuanced stories about these monuments. Um, these st stones have a real potential in many other communities of networking stories of place and people, faith and community um, together. And I think that Govan has nailed it or done a really powerful job of utilising the hogbacks in our contemporary world. And um, a stories that link together um, Scottish identity, local identity, the broader narrative of the, the communities on the Clyde with uh, uh, many different levels and nuances. And I think that many of the other churches that contain these stones can also have the hogbacks as iconic ways into the more rich stories of the church and its archeology span and the broader landscape around them. And that was my point to say really, is that whatever we end up thinking about hogbacks, they are powerful, they were powerful then as commemorative monuments and I think they're powerful now. And I think there's a there's a rich potential there for uh, re-engaging 21st commu century communities in these uh, recumbent carstone monuments that may be fragmented, lacking their colour, lacking their context, but still are evocative and are still widely understood and can be used to tell really exciting stories about uh, contemporary people and their different relationships, not only with their locality, but the broader um, past worlds and present world. Thank you very much. And there's some of my publications. Well, thank you very much as well, Howard. Um, that was that was a whistle stop tour, as you said. And I'm, I'm also exceptionally grateful for, <laughs> for, for, for good or ill. I don't think we've ever had so many questions in the chat box, which means I don't have to ask a question about something I know nothing about. And poor, poor Rob is going to have to sort of pick out a few choice ones. And perhaps we, we might even break the golden rule of finishing exactly at eight on the dot just to allow a few extra ones in as well. So Rob, have you identified a suitable first question? Indeed, yeah. I want to say, first of all, there was uh, there's some volunteers from Govan here who say that those stones are like their pets indeed. So that's good to hear. Um, I've got a, there, there were a lot of questions and some of them were quite specific. So I've picked out some of the perhaps lesser specific ones. But to begin with, are there any examples from Scandinavia or are these just found in Britain and Ireland and Scotland? That's a, a relatively easy one. That's a, as far as the literature I'm aware of and everyone else's discussion of them, there are no Scandinavian parallels uh, for these monuments. So that's an easy one to answer. Well, that's good. <laughs> um, the second question is, could these long haul shaped stones be an, be an allusion to Odin's Hall in Valhalla? That has been, that's an antiquarian idea that's been floating around. Um, I suppose too, I mean, there's so many things that could be said here uh, about that. Um, but yeah, of course, um, it could be. And people who encountered that, who were aware of either, they either believed in or were somewhere in, on the spectrum between pagan and Christian uh, belief systems would have, would have perhaps recognized allusions to the halls of gods. Um, but that may be one of many halls, everyone had a hall 
in Norse mythology, you know, and, and so I suppose, and, you know, that, that is not to be discounted as, 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 as fantasy, but it's difficult to know what features would be, you know, prominent in that. I think we have to think of these as Christian period, ecclesiastical setting, setting, that's in, in ecclesiastical settings, but that doesn't stop them having allusions to other stories amongst people visiting and accessing those places. Third question here, could this is this is relating to the Kirby stone, which he talks about. Yeah. Could the empty section on the Kirby stone suggest it stood against something, perhaps yeah. against a large flat stone on the ground? Yeah, I, I did discuss that in my paper and I sort of skirted over that fact. Yes, I mean, it makes me, does make, make one, one option is I was thinking about was whether we should think of that as, you know, this was not so much a, a, a longitude along the body, but could this have been an end stone? Um, uh, you know, could this have been a sort of a framing, uh, a burial plot for multiple individuals who are buried perpendicular uh, to, to, to the stone? Uh, and the, yes, then it built up against some mound or other feature. I mean, it's just really difficult to know, but there's some real options there for how, how it was designed. Maybe that backside, as we're calling it backside, just wasn't really that important and didn't need to be um, carved in the same, with the same quality of execution. Okay. Could the bears represent man overcoming nature and relate to the spirit overcoming man? Oh, forgive me, you broke up a little bit there. Could you repeat that, please? Yeah. Could the bears represent man overcoming nature and relate to the spirit overcoming death? I guess. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yes. Let's say yes. It definitely. No, I don't. I, mean, I don't know. I, I mean, I like that. I mean, the idea of the bear. I mean, the bear is obviously a, a very polyvalent um, um, uh, animal, a very powerfully evocative animal. I mean, it's a very human like animal in terms of its behaviours. I'm aware of a forthcoming book uh, being published on the archaeology history, history of religion of bears in Northern Europe. And I'm very excited to see that when it comes out because I think bears are so important in the folklore societies of Northern European societies. It's not just simply a Sami thing or a, a Norse thing. Um, and, 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 you know, there may be other allusions too, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how we go further with that. I just thought about suggesting that perhaps the default is that these are actually trying to evoke the qualities of a bear that you would have experienced perhaps in an aristocratic hall that bears tethered could have been a, f a physical feature of those environments and yes of course lots of further symbolism could have derived from that but uh, i think it would have been part of that material world of the late viking age i think we'll just do one more question is there a standard size or are there hotbacks in a variety of size yeah so the smallest we have, I think, is the Bidston hogback. And then we've got one of the miniature ones from Brompton, um, which if I skip back, I can't remember the exact size, but it's about 60, 70. Um, um, it's not 59.2 uh, centimetres long is the small um, hogback, but that's it's a fragment. So it would have been about a bit longer than that. But the, and the Hesham one is, 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 the, is the biggest. And I think that's about two. And then the, the, the Govan ones are huge monsters as well. Uh, two metres plus, I think. I can't remember the exact uh, scales. Uh, so they vary in size. And again, that's part of the thing that gets missed out in a lot of the discussions. They perhaps were being adapted to individual circumstances, whether it's the identity of the commemorative subjects, you know, the dead person or persons, or if they were not over a grave, perhaps they were of a different size to accommodate burial plots or multiple individuals. So yeah, I think, I think there's a, we don't have to see them as carved for one person. Fantastic. I'll hand it back to you now. Thank you. Well, no, well, uh, thank you very much, Howard. And uh, beyond the Govan fan club that's clearly in tonight. Uh, <laughs> um, and when you started to talk about pets in churches, I, I was taken back to a discussion about cathedral cats that we had in a former <laughs> talk. But um, no, but th that was marvellous. Um, you, you clearly touched on lots of things and got lots of excitement. I'm really sorry if we couldn't read all your questions out. There are literally tens, well, probably hundreds by the time this is over. So thank you very much indeed. Um, the final thing for me to do is just to say that our next talk, um, this time next month, um, is on a totally different topic, and it's going to be Dr. Martin Huggin, who is, you know, on, on the committee of the society, who's going to be talking about medieval hospitals. So um, that that 
it should be a fascinating thing. Um, I have a personal interest in medieval hospitals, or at least one. Um, so I, I can't wait to grill him on that one. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much for, for all joining in. And we hope to see you, you know, this time next month. Thank you. Thanks, folks. And I'll try and look for all the questions before I go. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.